Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Now available on Apple Podcasts, Podcast One, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You may have heard me talk about Bird Nutrition before. My family and I started Burt Nutrition because of our collective passion for health and wellness and to help people lose weight and just feel better about themselves. Who doesn't want to feel better about themselves? So right now, I'm just going to take a minute to talk to you about our staple product, our grass-fed whey protein that's available at BurtNutrition.com. We created a high-quality, healthy, pure protein supplement without an ingredient list full of junk. Our grass-fed whey protein is all-natural, hormone-free, It has the nutritional components your body needs to build muscle and lose weight. So stop buying just any protein powder on the shelf, especially if it has a ton of ingredients you can't read. Our grass-fed whey protein is low-carb, naturally sweetened with stevia, and has 23 grams of power-packed protein in every scoop, and it tastes amazing. Whether you're looking for a nutritious snack or a meal replacement with one of our awesome shake recipes, which include apple pie, pumpkin spice, and cinnamon roll, just to name a few, or you just want to include more protein in your diet, which we all need, try our great-tasting grass-fed whey protein. We have vanilla and we have chocolate, and it's awesome. Use the code SCJ15 for 15% off right now at BurtonNutrition.com. Use the code SCJ15 for 15% off today. That's awesome. That's awesome. 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 Oh, dude, that's awesome. Um, That's really awesome. Awesome. That's That's awesome. awesome. Oh, awesome. That's awesome. With Stephen Bradford. Stephen B. Bradford Anderson, what is going on, brother? Dude, we have a guest today that uh, I'm so excited to talk to because I have said maybe two or three words to him in my life. And uh, so I'm excited to get to know this man because he has been such a great addition to our show. Yes. Our show is nothing if we don't have a good adversary for you and Sonny because otherwise yes. it's just you and Sonny peacocking and around with nothing to do. And that's not interesting <laughs> that's to watch. That, that Well, sometimes it is. But most of the time it is not. And there's nothing better to have a uh, uh, quote unquote bad guy who is an amazing actor uh, come on and actually be a real threat to Sonny Carrithos. And we've, I've been trying to track this guy down for a while. Jason has and Steve has, but we finally did. And he's so gracious to join us. Oh. Jeff Colbert, thank you, brother, for joining us today. This is amazing. Oh, thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me. This is uh, this is fun, and uh, and you know, and it's it also it, it helps to ameliorate the feeling of that everyone hates me. Oh, my character. <laughs> yeah, I was I was in the middle of I was about to start a scene, and uh, I can't I can't remember who it was, but someone just turned to me right before they they counted down, and they said, "No one likes you, do they?" <laughs> the whole of Port Charles, no one likes you. <laughs> was that was that your acting partner just trying to like get in the place for the scene, or was it? Yeah, yeah, just... yeah, yeah. Sure, why not? Well, sure, I... a, a little a little bit of this before it starts. <laughs> just a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think Cyrus needs anyone to like him. Uh, apparently not. It's, yeah. it's no, you, we have a name for that. It's called a sociopath. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, you're doing an amazing job. <laughs> oh, God, thank you for saying so. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to the general hospital part uh, in, in a little while because we want to talk to you about kind of how this all came about your whole career. And mm. we find it so fascinating because I, I was going over your resume and I'm like, holy crap, this is the true definition of a working actor. Mm. I mean, it's, at, it's truly, it's, it's amazing. It's, uh, I mean, I, I was so inspired by you before, and then I, I, I saw all these credits, and I'm like, man, this guy, has, he's been in the trenches and doing this for four, 40 years, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. You know, and, well, and, not, and, and not just that, but a, a consummate artist, a musician, a fine artist. Like, we're so excited to, to learn about your creativity and where that came from and, and, and how you, you manage it all. So I read that you're from Montana. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, uh, outside of Billings. Uh, your, your your whole formative life, all your your all your youth was in Montana, except for the misspent bit. Well, I had a lot of misspent youth in Montana as well. But uh, <laughs> I, I I was born and raised in Montana, grew up on a farm there. Um, 
you know, uh, worked there off and on, uh, went out on the road. Uh, it, it was, I graduated from high school at the beginning of the 70s and there's, uh, you could still hitchhike then. And oh, so yeah. I hitchhiked around for a couple of years. I worked in a carnival on the road. I was, uh, you know. What? Wow, well, what, what did, did you do with what, the carnival? That, yeah, I gotta what, stop there what for What kind second. of carny were you? That's exciting. I, I sold corn dogs. Corn yeah. dogs and dogs. I had a joint on the corner of Bourbon and Iberville in, uh, at Mardi Gras. We did the Southern Circuit, the Winter Circuit. Wow. Um, yeah. So when, when you're selling corn dogs at Mardi Gras, is it people <laughs> that just need to absorb alcohol or is it just people? I mean, so like, oh. I'm sure you had some characters come up to you. <laughs> there was, I had, I took a Polaroid. Remember Polaroids? I took a yes, Polaroid sure. of two men uh, dressed as women in sequined uh, bikinis. And uh, they were be these beautiful black men out in front of my joint. And, and I just had them post for me. And I, my father would bring that up whenever anyone would come home. He'd say, good looking, aren't they? And, and they would go, yeah, they really are. They, ha, ha, they're men. You know, <laughs> farmer humor. Um, and, and also, uh, there was a, we, we sold uh, corn on a cob, and then we would dip it in um, margarine. And some guys came up and said, that's real butter? I said, yeah, of course it's real butter. And I, I gave it to them. They took a bite. This guy took a bite and said, that's margarine. He threw his beer at me. And there's a thing, if you're ever in trouble as a carny, you say, hey, Rube. And immediately, you're surrounded by guys holding various weapons. And they're ready to take your part in things. Wow. Um, so we back this guy down. Kiko had a little hammer down by his side, and DA had. Does that, uh, DA does that still work? Knuckles. Huh? Does that yeah, still work? You know what? I don't know. Hey, Rube. Um, I haven't been in a carnival for a while, so I'm not sure. <laughs> if it works. Next time I'm in trouble, uh, I'm just going to try. I do know that throwing a beer on someone in Mardi Gras is assault, and we we got a cop to the cop was going to take this guy in, but I, I let him go when he started crying. So. Oh, this, well, wow. hopefully, hopefully Cyrus will feel the same way when Sonny starts crying. So. I remember my uh, my step grandfather would never eat margarine. He said it, that's that's to grease wagon wheels. It's not to consume. It's to grease wagon wheels. <laughs> I like your step grandfather. Yeah. Yeah. So he would never eat margarine. And I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So. All right. Uh, so at, in your youth in Montana, did the idea of, of getting into the arts ever occur to you or was it either like either stay here and farm or get out and do anything else? You know what, it was, it was, I, I kind of got, well, you know, I kind of got run out of town. Um, I just, and it was a really, really, really small town. And I was just, uh, various things happened and I was no longer really, I couldn't really build a life there. And farming is so, so, so hard. It's yeah. really hard. And so I, you know, it was get out, but I didn't know get out and do what I, I was really, I was, I was really damaged as a, as a kid. I was really, I had no idea what I was doing or how to do it. And, and I didn't believe I was, uh, deserved to have life. So that was really hard for a few years. Oh, I can um, imagine. Yeah. Um, and, and, and yeah, so I just, I didn't know where I was going, but I knew where I couldn't be and it was, it was there. So I, mm. I left there. Yeah. And so hitchhiking, um, now, like, I, I remember, I, I mean, I was born in the 70s, but I, I, and hitchhiking was always something we were told not to do. Yeah. And I, I just, like, I thinking of a time when it was not just a kind of acceptable, but like, a reasonable way to see the country. Um, what, yeah. a, what a great, like, I mean, in the best of circumstances, in the worst of circumstances, you probably get murdered. But in the best of circumstances, you meet a lot of great people and get to go lots of places. That's so neat. A lot of, like, yeah, and the, actually the New York Times just had an article yesterday or the day before, there are three new books out about hitchhiking. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it became a craze when On the Road was published. Sure. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, and it was still safe in the early 70s because we didn't have quite as many serial killers then. And and people were people were willing to let you into their lives. And, and you know, you would travel and there was no, you know, there was... FM radio was just beginning. There was no such thing as a podcast or internet or anything like right. that. Sure. So you needed to be entertained over long distances. So you pick up a hitchhiker and talk. 
Yeah, that's, that's crazy that's- because my dad, he left uh, Indianapolis when he was 18 and he hitchhiked to L.A. Wow. He yeah. just knew that he had to get out. Same thing. He was like, I'm out of here. This is not for me. I don't want to be a factory guy. I don't want to work yeah. at a car factory. I'm, get, I'm hitchhiking. I'm going out to L.A. and get to try whatever it is. Did, he, did you grow up here? Uh, I grew up back in Ohio until I was 16, and then I moved out to live with my father here okay. uh, in, in California. So, um, But, you know, I just I think that's just so cool that you're like, hey, I know I don't want to be here, so I'm going. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. You know, and what amazing, what amazing, you know, unbeknownst to you probably, but amazing training as an actor to come across so many different characters working at a carnival, so many different characters, yeah. Um, yeah, like the, your your rolodex of interesting people must be very deep. It, yeah, I've I've met a few. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and um, have, what, have a few myself. So yeah. oh sure. At, at what point in that? your your kind of journey in that did you realize well let's go to LA and see what's there well I I came to LA I followed a woman to LA and I was not an actor then um yeah I was I was a trombone player and the only the first time I was uh even (laughs) close to uh uh seeing actors or being near actors was I played in the pit orchestra of Fiddler on the Roof at the University of Montana and J.K. Simmons was uh the conductor and uh, I watched these people on stage and I went, oh my God, because they were doing, they were having these emotional experiences right in front of me. And I was, I was in awe of this. But growing up in Montana at that time, you weren't exposed to the world the way you are exposed to the world now. And so I thought that there were people and then there were actors and that there was no crossover between the two. I didn't know that people could be actors. I, sure. I don't know what that means, but that's what it, how it appeared to me. So I came here, uh, followed this woman. She was an actress, um, and she never really was able to do anything. But, but I, you know, my, I started, I, I, just, I had some adventures. I, I went to work my first and last and only time in an office. I was a temporary paralegal for a, get here they were being sued remember that there was a brief moment i was in college and going to class made sense and i just said i need to go to a class and this woman suggested acting class so i went to the acting class and suddenly you know it was like this place where all this i had all this emotion inside and they said yes we want that Mm. so it was like being really big and discovering football like oh this makes sense here you know, yeah. I went to an acting class and they wanted all this emotion as, oh, this makes sense here. So that's how I, that's how I started it. And once, once that kind of dawned on you, what, how did the practical side work out? I mean, I'm sure, you know, obviously it's a very different process then than it is now, but you know, how did you take steps towards that? Well, I just, I, I studied for, for quite a while and okay. So Again, I was, I was, I was really repressed. I was really uh, inward turned. I was really dark. I was really in a lot of uh, darkness inside. And so you go to acting, you start opening that up and really working with uh, uh, like the Meisner kind of uh, approach. And, and so all of this starts coming out and then you have to find where to put it because you have an <laughs> act. And, you know, so it was, it was, I did, probably five years of four or five years of study without very much work at all Wow! because I was just trying to, you know, manage all of this. Sure. And uh, so I just kept studying and, uh, you know, and, and eventually just started, you know, trying to put myself out there. Well, isn't it, isn't it funny? Like, you know, doing, doing those kind of exercises and doing that kind of work, and, and, and then feeling that freedom to express that stuff. And then you go on a film set and they're like, all right, do less, do less, <laughs> do less. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah. that's, that a, that's a challenge, right? Like, I, and I imagine, cause you know, I, I, in terms of the characters that you've played, you know, you can play, you know, you, you can play a very outward villain or you can play a very inward villain. And, you know, there's interesting things to both. So, you know, I'm curious about like, you know, finding that freedom and then uh, kind of massaging it into what people need, you know? 
Well, you know, I, I just to hear you, you say that, I remember uh, Victor French was uh, a director and an actor who worked with uh, uh, Michael Landon. Uh, and uh, The Highway to Heaven, a two-part oh, Highway to Heaven was my first big guest star role. And Oh, wow. Um, I was, it was like this, it was this guy, he was called the monster. He had a big uh, uh, birthmark on his face and he didn't show himself to anybody. He was, he lived in, you know, alone and, and, uh, and started to come out. So it was really me and Victor wow. French. Like I had all this emotional life that I had built or lined up for the character. And then Victor French just started giving me permission. He, he knew how to, he, he recognized me and he started giving me permission to have that and to be that. And, uh, oh, wow. and, and it was like, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was like, you know, water to a, a, a man dying of thirst, you know? Sure. Did you have a, speaking of thirst, once you started getting into the business of it, did you have a, a sense of what you wanted to achieve? Did you have a passion for success or was it just like, I'm here, I'm doing this and it's feeding me. And do you know what I mean? Did you have a, did, did you know how, did you have an attack? Like, at the, I'm just curious about your frame of mind when you started, I guess. You know, I, 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 I thought, you know, at that time there was a, there was a real, uh, there was still a, very much a, uh, uh, distinction between uh, TV actors and film actors mm. and, you know, and, and, and people, uh, when I first started, people actually uh, hired you because you were the best person for the job, not because <laughs> you had the most tw Twitter followers or, <laughs> or the, you know, it, and it was, I mean, it was, it really was, this ex it was before the, um, you know, the, uh, the suits really took over the studios and, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of independent movies being made. And what I really wanted was, a you know, a, a, a career in, you know, I wanted to be lead in, you know, independent film. Uh, that's, that's really what I wanted. And then it, you know, and then what it really becomes is, you know, <laughs> who'll hire me. That's, sure. the, you know, sure. it's really just give me a job, man. Just let me act. That's, right. that's what really uh, progressed too. But at that time, you know, I, but I had a friend, um, Roy Call or R.D. Call. He, he passed a, a, a year or so ago. And, uh, you know, he came up at that same time. He did a lot of uh, Sean Penn movies and worked with Chris Walken a lot and all these guys. And, and, and he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't audition. And he wouldn't he wouldn't do TV or he, he held on to some idea mm. of what he was supposed to be. And he ended up moving to Utah and never working again because people were just like, well, if he's not going to read. We don't, we don't want to. You know. Yeah. That's a so, little crazy. Yeah. So it, it, it is it's a, it's a little extreme, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, sure. You know, and so I, I, Okay, you know, the thing about acting to me, the whole and the thing about the whole career, I, I find it to be one of the most profound spiritual practices because every actor to some degree gets into it because of the need for approval. Mm -hmm. Then you get approval. And if you're wise to any degree, you notice that there's not enough of this to give me what I need from it. There's sure. not possibly enough approval in the, in the world. <laughs> so then is there some other reason for me to be doing this? Okay. Yes, there is. Then working to find out what that other thing is and to align yourself with that other thing and to progressively let go of that need for approval is, uh, is, is where it really, um, it, it's really just a powerful practice and, a, and a, an extraordinary way to make a life for me. Well, absolutely. Yeah. You know, the, you know, the thing that, you know, we talk to a lot of actors and, you know, the, the feeling of freedom that comes from treating each audition, treating every experience in the business as being an opportunity to either enjoy your craft or share your craft versus a, the attachment to the job. Right. And I think that's you know, the detachment from that part of it, that, 
uh, I'm present in this moment and I'm having this experience and that is why, that's why I'm here and that the opportunity to have that is enough. Yeah, exactly. You know? Whether it's in a, a, a casting session or, or, or on the set of, 